And I want to talk to you here tonight about God's divine plan for Israel because it also involves us today. And how does it involve us? <clears throat> so I want to show you this and uh, we're going to go into the word of God. I want you to start with me, if you would, please, to Exodus chapter 19, verse 5 and 6. Exodus 19, 5 and 6. And this this passage that we're reading here in these two verses is God <clears throat> speaking to Moses to tell the children of Israel. <clears throat> Here's what he says. Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my commandments, my covenant rather, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure. Notice the word peculiar that he says here. The word peculiar here actually means very special, very special treasure unto me above all people. This is what the Lord told Moses to tell the children of Israel. <clears throat> if you'll obey my voice and do these things, you shall be this unto me of all people, for all the earth is mine. Look at verse 6. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, now, this is what I'm going to be talking to you about, that the Lord intended for Israel to be a kingdom of priests and show you what that meant and how that was to be a powerful and a very effective way of reaching the world through, the, it, through Israel and through the Jewish people. And he says here, 6, And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation, these are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. This is God telling Moses, say this now to Israel. And these are the words that he's saying to them. Obey my voice, you'll be a, a peculiar treasure unto me, and you shall be a kingdom of priests. I'm going to talk to you about this because most of us think automatically a priest is somebody in the Catholic Church or somebody in the Greek Orthodox Church or not the Greekness, they're just the Orthodox Church, whether it's Greek or Bulgarian or Roman or, or, uh, or Russian or whatever it is. But <clears throat> nevertheless, we think of priests as being that. Actually, the word priest comes from way back in the Old Testament under the law, and they were a very special people with God. Now, I want you to look with me as well in that same verse of Scripture here. We just uh, read to you here, Exodus uh, 19, 5 and 6, you shall be a kingdom of priests. And for the church today, look at 1 Peter 2, 5. 1 Peter 2, 5. You look at this with us, if you would, please. All right, it says, Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood. Now, this is Peter writing to the New Testament church. He's writing to the New Testament church here. <clears throat> you all, ye also, as live stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. And then in addition to that, just looking a little bit further on in that same second chapter, look at chapter, verses 9 and 10 with us. He repeats that when he says in verse 9, but ye are a chosen generation. Speaking of the Gentiles now, ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Notice that, a royal priesthood. And holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. Now, this be speaking, of course, to the Gentiles. Look, look at verse 10 which in times past were not a people, that's us, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So what we're talking about here is in the Old Testament is the Lord was saying to Israel, I'm going to make you a priest to the whole world. And then also Peter tells us over here in the New Testament, we who are in the church or we who are in the body of Christ or we who are in the kingdom of God on earth, whatever title or term you want to put it, we are a chosen priesthood upon this earth. Now, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about from the word of the Lord what all that means to us, what it meant to Israel, 
and what it means to us here today. Now, if you look in A here, qualifications for the priesthood in the Old Testament. Now, I want to talk to you about what it meant and what was, what was required for Israel to be a priest or be in the priesthood. So if you go with me here to the book of, of Exodus chapter 28 and verse 1, 28, 1, I'm going to read several verses here so that we can put this together and so that you'll understand here that there was a plan that God had for Israel. It's a plan that he had for them. Verse 28 and verse 1, And take thou unto thee Aaron, this is the Lord talking to Moses, take thou unto thee Aaron, thy brother. Now let me just say one word here, that Moses was from the tribe of Levi, there was 12 tribes because there was 12 sons of, of, uh, of Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. Levi was one of those sons. So whenever they would go into Canaan's land, those 12 sons would receive uh, a, an inheritance and it would be named after that tribe, whatever tribe it was, or whatever one of the sons it was. Uh, not, get, not to get complicated with it, but because of Joseph... And the Lord giving him a double portion, Ephraim and Manasseh, his two sons, would be equal with the other two, uh, the, the other 11 sons of Joseph, so that there would be actually 13 of these tribes, 13 altogether. Now, he's talking here about this particular tribe. Look at verse 28, verse 1. Now, thou, take thou unto thee Aaron thy brother and his sons with him. Notice that from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office, even Aaron, Nadab, and Bahu, and Eliezer, and Ithamar, Aaron's sons. So these were the four sons of Aaron. So Aaron and his sons would not only be Levites, but they would be even removed from the Levites to be even a higher elevated class of people among the Jewish people. So there would be the Jewish tribes that God would bless. There would be the Levites that would be among them that would deal with the tabernacle plan later to be the temple and all those kind of things. And then among them would be the priesthood who would come out even, for, or not come out, but they'd be of the, of the descendants of Aaron. And Aaron, of course, was Moses' brother. Now I'm gonna go a little bit further here and uh, show you some other verses of scripture here. This is in Leviticus, uh, Exodus rather, uh, 28, one. Uh, I wanna talk to you about, notice here they were all born of the family. That was the main thing, they were born in this family. Now, look at number two here. I wanna move into something else here. The anointing that was involved with them being in that family of the priesthood. Look at Exodus 29, Exodus 29. And I'm going to read verses 4. You, you don't have 4 there, but I'm going to read 4, and then I'm going to read 7. Uh, what do we do have for 28, 4, right here. Exodus 28, 4, then 7 and 8, and then to going to 30, uh, to chapter 30. Now look at 29, 4. And Aaron and his sons thou shalt bring unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and shall wash them with water. Wash them with water. Look at verse 7 now. I'm saving time. I jump scriptures sometimes, save time to get to the point. Then shalt thou take the anointing oil and pour it upon his head and anoint him. This is Aaron now we're talking about. Pour this oil upon his head and thou shalt bring his son, verse 8, and put coats upon them and thou shalt gird them with girdles Aaron and his sons and put the bonnets on them and the priest's office shall be theirs for a perpetual statute. In other words, it would always just belong to the descendants of Aaron, the office of the priesthood. I just want you to notice here how particular the Lord was about all of this and about the anointing oil that he had. Now, one other verse of scripture about the anointing that he received, I want you to go to Leviticus chapter 8 and verse 12. And he poured of the anointing oil upon Aaron's head. 
This is Moses now. And he poured the oil, anointing oil upon Aaron's head and anointed him to sanctify him. And Moses brought Aaron's sons and put coats upon them and girded them with girdles and put bonnets upon them as the Lord commanded Moses. Now, this was because that Aaron would be anointed as the high priest, the high priest, the one. Now, when he would die and pass away, his son, his oldest son, would become the high priest. And then when that son would pass away, then his oldest son would become the high priest. So there was always that anointed priesthood and that anointed high priest that had a very special place. These men were required of God to be very diligent about the things of God. They had to understand what God wanted, what God required, what God wanted them to do. They had to know all about various types of sacrifices that they had to make. They had to wear special clothes at special certain times. Uh, and they could not mess around with any of this. Everything had to be very diligent. They had to be very diligent and very, uh, very precise in all of these things because God required it of them because they were a very special people among a very special people. Praise the Lord. So God required that of them that they would be this, have this anointing all upon them. Uh, they were very special among Israel. Now, I want to go very quickly here to number three, the blessings promised to Israel. The blessings promised to Israel. And uh, I want you to look with me in these verses of Scripture. Uh, look at Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1. Now, this is what God promised Israel, that if they would obey the Lord, walk with him. This is Israel as a nation now. This is not the priesthood, but Israel as a nation. 28.1. It shall come to pass that thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe, to do all his commandments, which I command me this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. Notice that, folks. This is what God's telling Israel. If you'll obey my word, I will exalt you and lift you up high above all the nations. He goes on to say, I'm going to just save time here and jump down to verse 9. The Lord shall establish thee and holy people unto himself. Notice that. You'll be a very special people unto the Lord. Look at verse 10. And all people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord. They'll see that and know who you are and identify you with God Almighty. Look at verse 12. The Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure, the heaven to give the rain unto thy land in his season and to bless all the work of thine hand. And thou shalt lend unto many nations and thou shalt not borrow. This was the blessing God said that would be yours. And the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail and thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath. Verse, going on with that 13th verse, if, if that thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day, to observe and to do them. Observe, that means to take note of it, study it, see it, and then to do it. Praise the Lord. So he said, if you'll do all of this, God will make you a great nation, a great people, and a mighty people in the land, and you'll never be subject to anybody's wishes. You won't be pushed around. Everybody will regard you highly, and they will regard you in all things. Praise the Lord. So the blessings of God would promise to Israel that they would receive all of these things, and, uh, and they would have this special anointing over above all of the other nations. Uh, the priests were a special people among Israel, and Israel would be a special people among the world. You get the picture here. And then the Lord says, not only will you, Israel, be a special people among the world, but just as the priesthood is special among Israel, I'm going to make Israel special among the rest of the world. Praise the Lord. Now, notice here how he said, I'm going to bless you enormously. Uh, I'm going to use these maps here to show you something. This is uh, 
I'll come back to our outline here in a few moments. This is a, a map of uh, the Middle East there. It's, uh, I won't get into all the detail here, but this is Canaan's land right in here. This is Canaan right in through here. This is the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River right in here. And this is the Dead Sea right here. Can everybody see that? You see this in Jerusalem. And this is every, and Israel would be all of this, and also down on this east side as well, and then right on down here to this point right here. This is where it's called Elot today. It's the city, the southernmost city of Israel, right in here. And uh, on one side is Elot, Israel, and the other side is uh, Aqaba, which is a an Arab country here that belongs to Jordan. But, but I want to point this out. All of this was desert, all of this. This is Saudi Arabia, northern part of Saudi Arabia. This is all desert. And this is Egypt over here. If you went this way, it would be up into Europe. This is Turkey and on up Turkey. I'm going to give you another map in just a moment. Over this way would be Asia. Now, this map that I'm going to show you enlarges this whole area, but you can't hardly see this part of it. But take note of it here. This is why I'm telling you this. Right here, you see an arrow pointing. See that arrow? The red arrow. You know what it's pointing to? It's paired to Palestine right there. Now, this is all that Arab desert right in here. Now, here's what it boiled down to is that this was called the bridge of the earth. Historians, ancient historians called Israel the bridge of the earth. You know why they called it the bridge? Because caravans, travelers, these, uh, you know, these uh, camels that had that travel here and there and they would trade from one country to another. They would travel through here because if they came from Asia going to Africa, this is all Africa down to here, way on down, they'd have to go through Palestine. If they went from Africa to Europe, they'd have to go through Palestine. If they went from Europe to Africa, they'd have to go through Palestine, or from Africa to Asia, they'd have to go to Palestine. Or, and even down in here, if they came from South Asia, it come, they would have to come through the northern part of Palestine to go into Europe. What I'm pointing out to you here is that the Lord put Israel in a very special place that they may be able to affect the world. Now listen to me carefully here. God said, I'm going to bless you enormously. I'm going to prosper you. And you will be to the world like the priesthood is in your, in your people to Israel. So Israel would be like priests to the world so that when they travel through there and they would see your blessings and your prosperity and how successful you are in everything you do, they would ask the question, how did this happen? Why do you have these blessings on you? Where did this come from? What do you do? What's your secret of it all? And then you would tell them it's God, God Almighty, who brought us out of Egypt and we were nothing. We were slaves. We were paupers. He brought us out of it and he set us in this land here and he told us that he would bless us. And if, and if we would serve him and keep his word and keep his commandments, then he would bless us. And those people would say to them, if we do that, will we be blessed of God? And they would say, of course you will be blessed of God and we will teach you and show you and help you to understand what you need to do to be a blessing, amen, to many others and that you yourself might be blessed of this almighty God that we are blessed with. Now, do you understand what I am saying here that the Lord said to Israel, you shall be a blessing to the whole world. And this is what God wanted Israel to be. And this is what he wanted them to do. And he put them in what was called the bridge of the earth. That was sort of an ancient expression that was used back then. Now, I'm going to move on a little bit further here. Uh, look at the numbers 1421. This is sort of a recap of what we've been talking about here. Just one little simple verse here in Numbers 14, 1, and then I'm going to move into the New Testament area of this. 
Numbers 14, 1, right here. And he says, But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Now, folks, this was God's divine plan for Israel. This was what God wanted Israel to be. This is what he wanted them to do. If they would just keep his commandments, obey his word, follow those things, God would bless them, bless them, bless them, bless them. Everywhere they turned, they'd be blessed. You'd be blessed in the fields. You'd be blessed when you go out. You'd be blessed when you come in. You'll, you'll, be, you'll just be abundantly blessed. He also went on to say so much as to say, the afflictions and the sicknesses would not be among you as they are with other people. And he elaborated on this. And he said that you will be a blessing to the world because when the world comes through and they will say, we don't have that back over where I live in our part of the world, what do you do? And they would say, it's because of God. God has done this, God is doing this, and God has blessed us. And if you will do the same thing, God will bless you. And by doing it, folks, they would have evangelized the world by staying right where they were. It was God's divine plan for the world by using Israel as the messenger, as the, the vessel of hope for the world. But Israel fumbled the ball. I have to tell you that. Along the way, they got caught up in their own ideas. The Lord had all kinds of instructions. Every seven years, let the land rest. After seven years, six years, they'd say, why should I let the land rest the seventh year? If I had a big crop on the sixth year, I'll have another big crop on the seventh year. And so they go ahead and so they start disobeying the word of God. The Lord said, don't, don't, when you reap, don't reap up in the corners. When you glean, just turn your plows around. Leave the corners with all the corn and all the fruit and everything else that might be growing in that vineyard, the wheat or whatever it is, so that the poor people will have a place to go. So that the, the people who are visiting your area, people who... Uh, the widows who have lost their husbands or the children who have no fathers, they have a place to go. They can glean themselves. But after a while, they said, oh, no, if I got good corn here, well, I'll go up in there and get the corn there. Oh, what about the, the word of God is not all that important. You see what I'm saying? And little by little, they begin to get away from those little things until they got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And there was all kinds of commandments. There was 813 commandments all together for them to keep. And if they had been diligent as a people, God could have reached the world and used that nation to evangelize the world. And it would have been his, his very special and perfect plan for the world through Israel. But because they fumbled the ball, God had to turn to eventually to the Gentiles. Now, I'm going to go to the second part here because that's where it deals with us. Qualifications in the New Testament. We have to be born again. We have to be born again. I want you to look and uh, this is what's required of us today now. So if you go with us to uh, John chapter 3 and verses 3 and 5 and you know this so well I'm not giving you anything you don't know. Look at this very closely. <laughs> Nicodemus came to Jesus by night, as you know, and talked to him. Ever since. In the, verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now notice that. You've got to be born again. I'm associating the being born into the kingdom of God and into the family of God. I'm identifying that with being born into the priesthood. You couldn't get into the priesthood no other way but to be born into the priesthood in the Old Testament. You with me? I don't want to lose you here. You had to be born into the priesthood. And you cannot get in the church any other way but to be born again. And, of course, I won't get into the details on all how, how, what that involves, but just to mention briefly here. Look at verse 3 again. I'm going to read 3 again. Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Can't even see it. You can't even understand it. Can't grasp it. Look at verse 7. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. Ye must be. Notice that. So the Lord makes that statement here that being born again. So the Bible tells us here very emphatically that there is required of us to be born. Praise the Lord. 
Now, I want you to turn with me also to uh, Ephesians 3, 5, 3, 15, and I'm going to read the 14th and 15th verses. Look at this very closely here. I'm going to give you a little side information on this too. This is about us now. We're talking about the New Testament church. Look at 3.14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Notice that. Of whom the whole family. So you've got to be born again into the family. Everybody get that message? So just like that the priests had to be born into the priesthood. You couldn't be a priest no other way but to be the sons of Aaron. You had to be born into it. We have to be born again, praise the Lord, and we're born into the family of God of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. You don't know what that name is? Huh? It's the name of the Father. You don't know who that Father's name is? Go to, go to Acts 4.12. Go to Acts 4.12. Yeah, that, it's not in there. Just... Let's take a side note here just for a moment. Acts, okay, I don't want to rush them here. Acts 4.12. Neither is our salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's no other name. Now, along with that, look at Isaiah 9.6. This is another one. And this is only just... If you don't have this, if you've got your Bibles, write that in the margin of your Bible right there where it says, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Just write these little scriptures, these two scriptures right in there in the margin of your Bible. Isaiah 9 says, like, for unto us a son is born, that's Jesus. And to us a child is given, that's Jesus Christ. This is a prophecy of his coming. And the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful. That's, the, that's the, would be Jesus, but it doesn't say Jesus here. The name should be called Wonderful Counselor. He should be also be a counselor. The Mighty God. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, wait a minute. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. That's the man that's being born. A child is being born. But his name should be called Wonderful. The Mighty God. This means that Jesus was the Mighty God. The name Jesus is the Mighty God. The everlasting Father. The everlasting Father. What's the difference between the mighty God and the everlasting Father? The mighty God is the creator of all things. The universe, the heavens, the sun, the moon, the stars, and the earth, and everything on it. The mighty God is the creator. The everlasting Father is the life giver to everything on this earth. Everything. Everything that has life, God gave life to it. He's the everlasting Father. Praise the Lord. The Prince of Peace. Of course, we know that Jesus was called the Prince of Peace. We know that. So here, the, again, a scripture that identifies Jesus Christ as Almighty God, Everlasting Father. So whenever you read in the Bible about the Everlasting Father and you read about Jesus, it's not talking about two people. It's talking about two manifestations of the one God who is sometimes is referred to simply as the Mighty God or the Everlasting Father or my Father which is in heaven, because God is a spirit, and there's no place that God is not. But Jesus Christ was a man on earth, and in him dwell the fullness of the Godhead. It's like a light bulb. We had one light bulb in this auditorium, and Jesus made this statement one time. He said, just so I'm in the Father, the Father's in me, so I shall be in you and you in me. If they had one light bulb in here, we'd say the light is everywhere. In this whole room, you can see the light. The light is everywhere but the light's in the bulb. But because the bulb is in the room and the room's filled with light, the light's in the bulb, the bulb's in the light. Everybody got that? Okay, I made it as about as simple as I could there. But anyhow, Jesus Christ has got all made. I won't go any, any farther into that. I wanted to say here that this is the family of God. And whenever we are born again, we are born again into that family of God. I want to go a little bit further with that and talk to you about the anointing factor. The anointing, remember that Aaron was anointed, remember? He was anointed with that oil and he poured it right on his head. They put all those clothes on him that he had that priesthood clothes and then poured the oil right on. They didn't just, <laughs> like we do, you know, thank God, you know, we do. We just put the oil like that on the oil. 
but they poured it on their head and it ran down. How do you know that, Brother Myers? Because when you read over in the book of Psalms, and I won't go into that, but in the book of Psalms, there's a scripture where David referred to it, and he said that the oil ran, ran over. He was poured on, uh, Moses poured that oil on uh, Aaron's head, and it ran down into his beard. Praise the Lord. And all over his shoes and everywhere else. Praise the Lord. It, it describes it being that way. I won't go any further. It doesn't matter. The point is that we are anointed with something that covers us, that makes us special in God. Praise the Lord. So, do we have scripture for all of that? Look at 2 Corinthians 1.21. 2 Corinthians 1.21. Now he which establishes or establisheth or establishes us with you in Christ and hath anointed us, notice that, anointed us, we're anointed, hath anointed us as God, who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the spirit of our, in our hearts. He's also sealed us with that anointing of the Holy Ghost that he put upon us. The anointing. Of, we'll go to the other scripture in just a moment. But I want to just take a moment here and notice this here. He has sealed us. That means, folks, when you receive the Holy Ghost, you have a seal upon you. Now, let me just add this for whatever it's worth. In the Old Testament, the Bible says the holy men of old spake as they were moved on by the Holy Ghost. Prophets would be moved on by the Holy Ghost. And they knew that there was something better coming one day, but they did not fully understand or grasp it, but they knew it was coming. And they knew that they did not have it yet. But they were moved on by the Spirit of God, such as Elijah. The Spirit of God moved on him on Mount Carmel. He, man, he defied all those 850 false prophets and called fire down from heaven. Man, what a might, what a power he had. And a few days later, Jezebel, when she heard about it, said, let, let me, wait till I get a hold of him. He'll be just, just like, like some of them prophets that, they, that was killed down there uh, uh, where they call fire down there. He says, yeah, he's going to be just like one of them. And when he heard that about Jezebel, he fled for his life. What, Elijah? I mean, he had all that, you know, call fire down from heaven. Now he's running from, from Jezebel because the spirit had lifted from him. He was moved on by the power of God, and it was lifted from him. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. John the Baptist was in prison. He didn't have the Holy Ghost. He was moved on by the Holy Ghost, but he never had the Holy Ghost. Baptism like you and I, he was not sealed with that Holy Ghost promise. And when John the Baptist, praise the Lord, he said, you know, behold, the Lamb of God, take away the sin of the world. But when he was in prison, he called his disciples and said to them, go and ask Jesus, are you the one that should come or look we for another? I'm not so sure whether he's really the one yet right now. I just need a confirmation. Do you understand how he doubted a little bit there? And then they came back and said, he healed sick. He opened blinded eyes. He raised the dead. He did it. Okay, that's, he's the one. He's the one. John the Baptist had it right, and he knew that. But whenever Paul, he said, I've finished my course. I've fought, fought a good fight, finished the course. And, I, and, and I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, not only for me only, but for all them that love is appearing. And he was ready to go to meet, and of course, Paul was beheaded, as you well know, because he preached the gospel. But he said, I'm ready to go. I fought a good fight, I got for it. No doubt about it, because he was sealed with that Holy Ghost. Folks, you see, we have a baptism of the Holy Ghost, an anointing of the Holy Ghost that seals us. We're sealed with it. It doesn't mean we can't backslide and God has given us a free will that we can make choices like that. That's why you don't want to do it. And the devil will come around and, and, and try to get you to leave the faith, leave the church, walk away, go after some other stuff. He'll do that, praise the Lord. And you will think, oh, that's just my thoughts. That's just what I'm thinking. That's just, you know, I think I'll just go over here to hang out a little bit. Yeah, I'll go in this bar and I'll drink a Coke and everything, but I won't drink any liquor. Yeah, I like the people I'm talking to. And blah, blah. Next thing you know, you're sipping a beer. Next thing you know, you understand what I'm saying? So, yeah, we can miss out with God, but God has put a ceiling of the Holy Ghost inside of us. Praise God. Let me move on here. I got 
some good things here to pass along to you. So the anointing of the Lord. Uh, look at 1 John 2.27. We talked about the anointing of the Lord there in 2 Corinthians. Look at 1 John 2.27. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. Look at that. The anointing which you have received of him abideth in you. Look down at verse 28. Now that's not in your scriptures, but if you look at verse 28 with us as well. And now little children abide in him. He abides in us and we abide in him. That when he shall appear, we shall have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Praise God. Now I'm just pointing out to you here that we have this anointing that God has put upon us. We call it the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I won't go into detail. We could talk all about the plan of salvation, the anointing of the oil and all those kind of things. But God, praise the Lord, uh, anointed those priests with the oil, but with us, he anoints us with the, with the spirit of God. Amen. The anointing of the Lord. Now, I want to go to part three. The gospel and God's blessings to the world would come through the church. Would come through the church. Because when Israel fumbled a ball not to, not to evangelize the world because they fell short of keeping his commandments and his word, then the Lord in the New Testament, praise the Lord, has called us to do that. So I want you to go with me, if you would please, to the book of uh, Mark, chapter 16 and verse 15. Look at 16, 15. This is Jesus speaking here, and he said unto them, this is unto his uh, disciples, who would become his apostles or when they would receive, when they would receive the Holy Ghost. Of course. And he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Notice here that he gave scriptures and instructions to the church to go into all the world. Now, you're not going to be the bridge of the earth and caravans passing through and see the blessings of God upon you, but you're going to go out and take it to them because the world's big, the world's wide, and they need to hear it. Folks, that's the commission to the church. It still stands. It's never been taken away. We are still to reach the world. We're still to reach them every way we can. I, I'm, I'm very happy about our plans to have this big stadium at the, uh, at the at the high school over here, uh, and have a a three day you know uh, convention or not a convention about a three day uh, revival. What do you call it? Just, yeah, yeah. Thank you. And we'll just you know have preaching and singing and and invite people to come to it and be outside. And people say, "Well, I don't want to go to church." Okay, come to that. Amen. I don't know how much of, many of you are aware of that some of those football players over there had come to this church and gotten baptized and, and so gotten the Holy Ghost. I don't know how many of you are aware of that, but there is a move among the, the football players at that high school over there from this church and the effects of it. Brother John Johnson can tell you about it. He's, this vice, he's the assistant principal over there. But I'm just telling you here, folks, that God is doing wonderful and mighty things and he's going to keep on doing it. And you and I have to say, God, use the church in these last days like you want to use us. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So he said, go into all the world, preach the gospel. Every creature, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, uh, we were to read the 17th verse here. The, by these signs, these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. Shall they cast out devils? They shall speak with new tongues. I speak, that's speaking in tongues when you receive the Holy Ghost. So I won't go there either, but that's another, that's a whole other message. Praise the Lord. Amen. The word of God there. All right. So the gospel, uh, God's blessing to the world. Is going to it. Now, I want to go back to the point about the priests here. Only the priests could offer sacrifices. Now, hear me closely on this. The priesthood were the only ones that could offer sacrifices under Israel, in, in, Israel, in ancient Israel. Yeah, the people could not offer sacrifices. They, they had to offer sacrifices for their sins, for their transgressions. They had different things that had to be done, even, even if they want to just have a, the blessings of God, the, 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 the spirit of the Lord. They had sacrifices 
in the morning and the evening, but the priests were the only ones to offer the sacrifices, the only ones. Praise the Lord. Now, Brother Myers, what has that got to do with us? Praise the Lord. How we offer sacrifices in the New Testament. I'm going to go back to that original scripture that we first read to you in 1 Peter, where it talked about us being a holy priesthood. I'm going to go back to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. Look at this. This is that first verse, second verse that we read to you, the one that's way up here. Uh, up here, I'm going to go back to that one. So that's the same thing as you see here. 1 Peter 2, 5. And look at this verse with us. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices. Everybody see that? Spiritual sacrifice. We had to offer up, sp what spiritual sacrifices? What is that? Well, I'm glad you asked. Thought you'd never ask. <laughs> okay, go over to verse 9. And this is where we read that verse of Scripture again to you. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, that priesthood word again, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that means a very special people with God, that ye should show forth the praises of him, praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. This is how we offer up sacrifice is through praises, the praises of God. Praise the Lord. And so I'm pointing out to you here how that God has also ordained that we offer sacrifices as well. Now, go to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. Hebrews 13, 15. If you got your pen, make sure you underline this verse. Praise the Lord. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Now, what are you trying to say, Brother Myers? I'm trying to say just as in the Old Testament as they offered animals for sacrifice, the New Testament, there is no more of that because Jesus Christ was the price paid on Calvary. He offered himself. His blood was shed. There's no more need and never will never be another need for animal sacrifices ever. So what is our sacrifices? Our sacrifices is a sacrifice of praise. When you, when you come to the house of God, let's praise the Lord. When you walk into God's presence, let's praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's say, God, I love you. I praise you. Sometimes your arms may not, they may be heavy, but you can say it. Sometimes your arm's not heavy, and you can put them both up there. Sometimes one's bad, but you can put the other one up. Sometimes the other one's bad, maybe you put that one up. But always offering praise unto God. And what is praise, Brother Myers? Praise is saying, God, you are everything. Praise the Lord. You're my hope. You, you, you made everything. Just worship God for, for who he is. He's the creator of heaven and earth. He made the sun, the moon, and all the stars. Hey, he knows the number of the stars. He knows how many is out there. I mean, when man starts looking through telescopes and he sees more and more of them, he gets so baffled. He says, oh, my God, there's so many of them. How in the world will we ever be able to number them? God's already numbered, and I go a step further. I can show you the Bible in three places where he's named them. Amen. The stars have names with God. Yes. That's how great he is. Yes. Praise the Lord. And then everything on earth, yes. everything on earth, God has made it and put his wisdom and his knowledge. And my goodness, we can praise him for everything on earth. I mean, I can praise him for myself, for my family, for you, for us. You know, I can praise him for relatives. I can praise him for all these. Or I can praise him for the birds. I can praise him for the fish. I can praise him for the animals that live. It's amazing to me how God has put in, folks, don't ever tell me there is no God. Oh, that's the, that's, the Bible says a fool has said in his heart there is no God. Don't ever say there is no God. I mean, that's the, that's the most idiotic thing in all the world that we evolved from some 
tadpole that jumped out like a frog, and a frog, and it became something else. Finally, it became monkeys. Then it became, and then somehow gorillas became humans. And, and, uh, forget all that stuff. I've, I've seen that stuff. I've saw they try to teach all that stuff in school when I was a kid. And I'd go to church. And I'd hear them talk about the Lord made Adam and Eve in the garden. Praise the Lord! And from them came all the human race. I still believe it that way. But let me just say this: that God has made everything that exists, praise the Lord. And he makes us to think so clearly. We can see. You can think about it. You can see. Praise the Lord. We can, we, you know, we, we, can, we, we have taste buds. We can taste stuff. We can, oh, I don't know, it goes on and on, how I, even how our bodies work. And then I start looking at little things. I sit on my patio sometime, and, and I, see, uh, I see a lizard running by. And I'll say to myself, that lizard knows how to have a, a young ones. And he knows how to take care of them, or she does, whatever he or she might be. <laughs> they know how to take care of them and teach them how to take care of themselves. Then I see a big bird walking outside, you know, in my backyard out back there in the grass, picking up worms out of the grass. And I say, that bird, that little old head he's got, little old tiny thing, but he knows how to set on the, she does know how to set on her eggs and how to hatch them. That male bird knows how to protect the female and the little ones when they're walking around. They know how to teach them how to, you know, how to eat. If they're ducks, they teach them how to, they show them how to swim, how to catch fish. I mean, it's amazing to me that in everything, God has put all of this knowledge and wisdom for that specific species. So, it's time to just say, God, you're the great, mighty God of all heaven and earth. Your ways are high and lifted up. I exalt your name. I praise your name. I worship you. That's the sacrifice we give. That's our sacrifice, not animal sacrifices. But Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we thank you. Jesus, we praise you. Jesus, we glorify you. Jesus, we worship you. I mean, we can go on and on and on and on. Praise the Lord. Just thanking the Lord. We had this prayer this past Monday night. Pastor opened it up for some people and all of us that was here. My, what a prayer time that was. People, some walking, some sitting, amen, some and just worshiping the Lord, some a little loud, some quiet, but we were all just saying, Jesus, we praise you, we love you, we worship you. You may say God, you may say Jesus, you may say my heavenly Father. It doesn't matter what you say, it's all him. Praise the Lord. He's the one. <coughs> the only one. Thank you, Jesus. And there is none other beside him. Amen. Now, i got just a few minutes here. I'm going to take you a step further. One step further. Everybody with me? Yep. All right. I want you to look in Revelation chapter 1, verse 6. Revelation 1, 6. Now, remember, the Bible said that we shall be uh, a kingdom of priests, right? We should be priests. Now look in Revelation 1, 6. And hath made us kings and priests. Whoa, wait a minute. He talked about he has made us a holy priesthood. And that's found two places over there in, 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 in 1 Peter. Now he's saying we are kings and priests. Wow, that's a little extra special there. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> wow, that's powerful, Brother Myers. Well, let's look at another verse. Are you sure that really means what it means? Well, look over in Revelation 5.10. And has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Now, or over the earth, or on the earth, however, the, the holy city will be over to under, whatever. Let me just say this here to all of us today. Not only did God make us priests that we might be able to praise him, worship him, offer sacrifices unto him, and to be a testimony and a witness to the world, but he's given us the power, the authority to do it. Listen to me closely here. Not only are we priests, but we're kings. Kings have authority. They have power to do it. 
Now, I'm going to have you read another verse of Scripture with us. Look in, uh, look in Matthew 28, 18, and 19. Matthew 28, 18, 19. This is uh, what's called the Great Commission, the same thing we read over in Mark a while ago. Mark's re rendering of it was going to all the world preach to God, but this one's a different one than by Matthew. Look in Matthew 28, 18. Look at this closely. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. It's all in me. Go ye therefore. You get the message? Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost. Of course, we know that name is Jesus. We just talked about it. <clears throat> Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Now, this is a verse of scripture here, here that's simply saying that the Lord has given us the power of kingship because he is king of kings and lord of lords. Now, I, uh, I'm going to read one other verse of scripture. As kings, we have the power and the authority to reach the world. And we have that authority. Look at Acts 1, 7. 1 7. I'm going to close out. My time's gone here. 1 7. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power. Everybody say with me, power. power. Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. This is what he was telling his disciples just before they received the Holy Ghost. Ye shall receive, and just before he ascended into heaven. And ye shall be witnesses unto me. Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Everybody say with me, America. America. We're about the uttermost part of the world as far as Jerusalem is concerned. We're way over here on the other side of the world. But God has been good to us, has he not? And yes. <clears throat> he has said here that you shall have power and we'll have power, praise the Lord. I don't mean power in Washington, D.C. I'm talking about the power of the Holy Ghost, power to witness, authority, praise the Lord. You can say, <clears throat> I pray in the name of Jesus, like this brother, your brother Veely testified that he'd been, he's been healed of the Lord. I mean, he was in bad shape. We were praying for him. And then the God has touched that man and healed that man. And I think there's going to be other healings because there's the power of God and this the authority of God. Jesus is king of kings. If he's king of kings, we must be kings too, <laughs> right? If he's kings of kings, then we've got to be kings. So praise the Lord that we have, we are a priesthood, but we're also a kingship. Amen. So God has made us kings in power and priesthood, praise the Lord, with that anointing and with that special being born into the family. God is so good to his people. He's good to those that love him. God bless you, and you have been a good class. And I thank God for every one of you that are here tonight and all of our people that walk with God and serve the Lord. Can we just stand and praise him together and worship him? And let's just thank the Lord and tell him how good he is. Praise the Lord. Jesus. Oh, Lord, we love you so much. We thank you for your wonderful salvation, for your gospel, for your truth. Thank you for your presence, for your power, for your spirit. <coughs> thank you, Jesus, that you love us, that you went to Calvary for us, Lord. Thank you for your grace, God, the grace of God that's extended to us. Thank you for coming our way, way over here on the other side of the world in America. And we have received this wonderful experience among all of our people in this country and on rest and other parts of the world. In Jesus' name, we love you and we praise you. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed in his name. Everybody greet each other however way you want to greet them. Bump fists, bump elbows, shake hands, whichever. God love you. Praise Jesus. Thank you, God.